Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, on uh, This is the DB2 Night Show, the uh, LUW edition. I'm Martin Hubel, your host. Unfortunately, our, I got the uh, music playing and it doesn't come through my speakers. I am bummed. But uh, as they say, the show must go on. Uh, today, uh, we have uh, two special guests with us, with us, Les King and John Bell of the IBM Toronto Lab. Are you, how are you doing, Les? I'm good. How are you doing today? Thanks for having uh, having me on the show today. I'm glad that you and John are able to join us. How are you doing, John? Doing just fine. Thank you very much. Good. I'm suffering with the seasonal allergies of being outside cleaning up leaves. They uh, got the best of me this year. And then I went to practice last night and uh, they pulled out our Christmas music. And unfortunately, it got wet over the summer and it's covered with mold. So that might have exacerbated things. I, it was so bad, I decided to do a COVID test and I uh, don't have that. But uh, as it stands right now, I could sure do with feeling just a little better, but uh, such is life in big city. So with that in mind, let me get myself out of the way here by, uh, by uh, showing my uh, uh, introductory slides as always. Here's our social media information, uh, Twitter, follow hashtag DB tonight. I, I always make a point of posting when the show's coming up and when the replay is available on uh, YouTube. So do that. We also have YouTube now, and that's a very convenient way for people to uh, look at the what, what was broadcast. We seem to sometimes have a small audience. And we always seem to have a large number of people viewing the show after the fact. So I encourage you to, to follow the, the uh, Twitter link. Hopefully everything will stay the same now that, that Twitter has a new boss. We'll see how that works out over time, won't we? Disclaimers, as always, uh, uh, we respect copyrights, things are being recorded, and all of other, other things like that. Uh, you can read that at your leisure. Quick announcements. Our next show on uh, uh, the LUW edition is Carrie Romanoff from the IBM Toronto Lab, and we're going to talk about another new point release, 1158. I've seen that. It looks really exciting. You will want to catch that. Our next show is on November 18th on the Z side, and that's transforming db 2 for ZOS application development with uh, Catherine Suhu from the uh, Silicon Valley Lab. I will be lining up a speaker shortly for December the 9th on the Z side. I was going to do it this week, and, well, you know, those leaves were calling. Uh, so, as always, uh, DBI is our uh, founding sponsor of the DB2 Night, DB2 Night Show. Uh, you can uh, download information on their latest and greatest release. They've got some new stuff out that you might be interested with in if you're worried about DB2 LUW performance and service levels and that sort of thing. You can go to the uh, DBI website, find a demo, and other things of that nature. Our winner from last month was David McCoy of Prudential. Congratulations, you got an Amazon gift certificate coming your way. And as always, we thank our sponsors, uh, namely yours truly, Martin Hubel uh, Consulting and DBI. And with that, uh, we're just about ready to turn it over to you guys, but we have to do our studio audience polls first. And we'll do those right now. Our first poll is uh, what DB2 versions are you currently running? And uh, that poll is being distributed right now. And we're, of course, getting higher than uh, higher than 100% because people, people have multiple ones. Uh, but people seem to be getting fairly current. That's great to see of our current studio audience. audience. Oh, I will say squirrel. There's the, uh, the Chihuahua cartel in the room has decided that they need to buy. And our next poll is uh, how many DB2LUW uh, databases are you currently, uh, uh, do you currently have? And uh, they actually are normally quite quiet. Uh, we bought some new furniture and we thought they wouldn't figure it out so quickly, but 
you know, chihuahuas, when it comes to uh, uh, their prey instincts, they, they, I'm around at this time of year and the squirrels are slow and fat and plentiful. They are having quite, quite the time out there. And uh, with that, we've got the same uh, people, uh, same number of people voting. We'll share that. Yeah, people are pretty busy these days. 100 to 1,000 uh, databases. That's about what I'm seeing. A lot of instances out there in databases. All right, we'll add that one and we'll do the next one, which is what are you using DB2 LUW for? And uh, again, you can vote for more than one thing here. seeing where people are on data science. And actually what I'm seeing there is pretty uh, consistent with my experience. OLTP still uh, runs uh, rules of roost, uh, mainly warehousing is, uh, there can be that as well, but it's it's gotta be OLTP as well. So with that, I'll close that off and share that result. And we have OLTP and OLTP and warehousing. So that's uh, good to see. Okay, with that, uh, we'll move along uh, and we will, um, I guess I got my, my uh, weekly joke slide in here and uh, this describes my week perfectly. Uh, I went out on Sunday and cleaned up what I thought was at least 80% of the leaves and then I went out uh, on Wednesday and cleaned up the same number again. So I really only done 50% the first time around. But next year it could be easier if we only had one big leaf or other way when it happened. All right, with that, Les and uh, John, I'll turn it over to you and I'll let you introduce yourselves any further. Uh, with that, uh, let me uh, find the uh, attendees. And uh, I'll pick this one to start. Make you the presenter. Les, is this going to you? Yep, yep. If you can send it to me, that'd be great. I'll show my screen here, and then we'll pass it to John Perfect. in a bit. Okay, there is a question and answer tool within GoToWebinar. I will be monitoring that, and I'll break in as appropriate with questions. But uh, I think we're ready to go. And I'll, I'll mute myself in the meantime, so the Chihuahuas won't need to interrupt you. All right, uh, great. So first of all, uh, Martin, thank you so much for having us on today, and uh, really looking forward to sharing this topic with the audience. And as you can probably tell from the template, this is a presentation that was uh, also done at uh, IDUG North America and just recently a couple of weeks ago at IDUG Europe in Scotland. And we've actually even made some updates since then. So if you did happen to be uh, in Boston or in Edinburgh and saw this presentation, uh, we've actually already got some new news uh, since that time. So let me jump right in. And of course, feel free to post questions uh, that Martin's gonna be keeping an eye on. Uh, whatever we don't get a, time, a chance to answer on the audio portion of the show, I'll go in and um, I will make sure all your questions get answered in the uh, uh, in the in the chat room or uh, whatever the best way to accomplish that is. So, uh, for from the point of view of an introduction, it's going to be a joint presentation with my myself, Les King, and and John Bell. And I'll let John introduce himself when he starts. Um, but uh, unless King, uh, my background has always been with DB2. I uh, have been on a few of the DB2 Night shows before and uh, always enjoy spending time uh, interacting with our uh, user and client base. Uh, I've had a variety of roles in DB2 and, and uh, one of my primary roles right now is in the area of uh, our sales and tech sales enablement. So uh, jumping in, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the first part of the presentation will be on what's going on, uh, what are we up to, what are our objectives, um, and and uh, what are we delivering. And then uh, the second half of the presentation, John's going to do a drill down on the actual reference architectures. So 
just to kick off the presentation, I think it's very important that as we talk about anything specific that DB2 is doing, and we're going to have a very specific topic today in the area of DB2 Warehouse, is that we are leveraging a common engine. And so whatever deployment form is the best uh, deployment form for yourself individually and your strategy, it's the same underlying engine. And that could be deployments on premise, that could be uh, deployments in the cloud, Whatever it is you decide that uh, you uh, want to deploy that aligns with your specific company strategy, uh, it's the same DB2 engine regardless of the deployment form of the product that's being used. So everything we talk about today from a DB2 perspective, while we're referring to a particular set of reference architectures, it's leveraging that same DB2 engine um, that you'd be using everywhere else. And what we're uh, talking about when we refer to the DB2 warehouse reference architectures is a follow-on to a set of appliances that are out in the market today. So there was a pure data system for operational analytics, PDOA, uh, that came out back in the mid-2010s. Uh, the latest and only remaining version in support right now of that is version 1.1, and it is a Power8 based, AIX based analytic appliance. And then we had the follow-on next generation to PDOA, which was the IBM Integrated Analytics System. Again, uh, Power8 based, uh, but not AIX. This was uh, Power Linux Little Endian um, as opposed to AIX. And for a short period of time, we uh, were trying to consolidate both the PDOA line and the PDA line, which was Postgres, Natiza, engine-based. And, and then uh, MPS has come out and basically IS was positioned as the natural follow-on for PDOA because both of these are DB2-based, all right, as opposed to the Natiza technology. And then uh, the IBM integrated analytic system is inside what has been called IDA, which is uh, the appliance sidecar to DB2 for ZOS for accelerating analytic workloads. Uh, so that's distinct from the IDA software only. Uh, that's also DB2, of course, but it's not, uh, it's not leveraging the IAS appliance. And so what we're talking about here today is a follow-on to our existing analytic appliances. PDOA version 1.0 has already end of support, got a few customers and service extensions, but the lion's share of our PDOA footprint is on version 1.1. Um, and then IIS actually had two models that went out as well, or two generations. We had an M4001 and an M4002. About 15% of our IIS clients were on the M4001, uh, and we sold the last one of those back in 2018. It was only out for a couple of years. And since 2018, we have been selling the M4002. And here you can see our planned end of support dates and why it's important for us to basically talk about what's next in the world um, as a follow-on to our analytic appliances because a set of these clients are going to be running into um, an end of support date uh, for the PDOA version 1.1 and the uh, ISM 4001 uh, in the next year or so. On the 4002 side, lots of time. If you're running, if you purchased IIS anytime after about second half 2018, you have M4002. And the earliest we will end of support the M4002 is in late 2026. That hasn't even been announced yet. Only the M4001 and the PDOA version 1.1 have been announced at this point. So there is actually no information out there about the M4002 end of support because uh, we haven't done any formal announcement on it. Uh, but uh, I can tell you that the earliest that it will end of support, like I say, will be second half 2026. So lots of time there. Nonetheless, we need to get our next gen out for the clients who are uh, getting to a point where they're ready to move to what's next. Um, some are moving to the M4002. Uh, and and uh, others are looking at what we've got lined up next, which includes both on-premises options and cloud options. So 
one of the things that we're doing right now is we're shifting away from an appliance form factor a little bit. And you've heard me use the term reference architecture. So why am I using the term reference architecture instead of appliance? And the reason I'm doing that is because there'll be a couple of subtle differences between the appliance um, and the way we go to market traditionally with PDO and IS and how we're going to go to market uh, with this next gem. And uh, one of those differences is that we have more variations this time around because we're seeing from a DB2 customer footprint perspective that there is a significant subset of our clients who uh, want to remain on-premise and have more of a traditional uh, deployment form. But not surprisingly, we're also seeing a significant uh, percentage of our clients that are trying to align their next generation of the analytics system with whatever their strategy is for modernization and moving to the cloud. And so reality is we really had to have multiple options. And so for the on-premise, we'll have an x86 reference architecture and a power-based reference architecture. And we're gonna go into the technical details of both of those with John a little later in the presentation. And then for the cloud, uh, our strategic, of course, offering is a fully managed DB2 Warehouse and Cloud, and we'll go into a few more details on that, and in particular, the Gen 3 of DB2 Warehouse and Cloud that's coming in the next uh, 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 few months. But we also have the ability for you to take the best practices associated with the reference architectures in number one here and deploy a self-managed um, solution uh, in, in the cloud as well. Now, why would we do that? The purpose of doing that would be to uh, provide a solution on cloud providers where we don't have the fully managed solution there yet. But uh, if we have the fully managed SaaS offering available, then that would be what our recommendation is. And so here's how you can see kind of a little bit of a breakdown. I'm not going to go through all of the information here. Um, uh, obviously, everybody will, will get a copy of this and can uh, um, take a look at uh, some of the details here. But the first thing that we're doing is we're shifting from what is called the common container today to the universal container. Now, the common container is something we came out with prior to our acquisition of Red Hat. And this was a, a, a Docker-based uh, container deployment solution. And now what we've done is we've come out with what's called DB2U, which is the same DB2 common engine. So that's, again, very important point from the beginning. So that universal container is the sort of next gen of our container technology, which supports Red Hat OpenShift, uh, as well as Open Kubernetes platforms. And you can see some of those listed here, like AKS, EKS, you know, Arrow, Rancher, Rosa, and so on. So that's the first thing. We're upping the gen of the underlying container. Uh, second, we're sticking with uh, both a power-based and an x86 based path forward for our clients. Uh, we have uh, all of our analytic appliance clients are on power today, and we're seeing a lot of interest in, especially those who want to remain on premise, to continue to stick with their uh, power based footprint. So, we're going to have a Power 10 based solution there. And no matter which path you go down, you have you know, the same functionality, you have support for petabyte sized warehouses. You have functional compatibility with the existing analytic appliances. You've got, of course, performance equality and, and of course, likely significant improvements because we're using next, you know, latest generation hardware and so on. And they can tie into the cloud pack for data ecosystem as a source if, if that's something that your organization has bought into. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about that last column, the DB2 Warehouse on Cloud, could you see a few no slash yes? And the, and the thing is about the DB2 Warehouse on Cloud that's out there today has a subset of the capabilities that our analytic appliance does, but in first quarter next year, we're going to have what's called Gen 3, which closes any of those gaps. And I'll, I'll go into that in more detail as well. The other thing we're doing, in addition to providing lots of uh, flexibility, right? Unlike, eh, here's the one appliance, use it or don't. Um, but some flexibility here to the uh, uh, deployment choices um, that, that our clients have is that we also want to make sure we maintain the appliance-like uh, characteristics 
in these reference architectures because a lot of clients are using the appliance today because they want that appliance experience. So I want to make sure that uh, the deployment uh, services are included. We're going to wrap these offerings with um, deployment, maintenance, expansions, and so on, so that when you buy one of these uh, reference architectures, that from, from the point of view of the user experience, the customer doesn't have to worry about anything until it's time to start, you know, creating tables and loading data. All right. So that is consistent with the um, appliance experience, and we want to maintain that um, uh, that type of an experience. Uh, the other, the one thing that would change is that from a client's perspective, uh, that the the hardware and and the software would be purchased separately. All right. And that's because we're giving a choice on the hardware platform. I mean, DB2 is the same on either side, but you have a choice between the x86 and the power-based solution. So there is a separate thing um, that gets ordered there. The closest to the appliance experience would be, of course, our SaaS offering where everything is just included and you don't have to make separate decisions around storage and, and servers and so on. So the SaaS model from a cloud perspective is is the most appliance-like and the most hands-off from the point of view of our uh, customers' experience. But the bottom line is, regardless of which path you're going down, uh, we are making sure that we're protecting as much of that appliance experience as possible, um, and and also uh, uh, we are looking at if you're running the reference architecture and it's been validated by our serv our um, uh, services organization, Expert Labs, that, yep, this is the reference architecture and it's not a role your own, um, that uh, we'll, we're trying to maintain the single point of support as well. So um, uh, that's really the the, the key uh, message here. So let's just start jumping in now to some of the details of the offerings and we'll talk about the um, cloud first. So from a cloud perspective, I think we all understand what the value proposition of the cloud is, right? We're talking about our fully managed SaaS-based offering. It's still DB2, so you've got all the performance, scalability, um, that DB2, DPF, and our ability to scale out from an MPP, shared nothing architecture brings to the table. That's all available in the cloud. We've got the built-in HA for continuous availability. We've got support for, um, QRAP and technologies that allow for DR environments and, and continuous availability. So uh, everything that we're used to from an on-premise perspective can be uh, brought to the table from a cloud perspective. And we have our fully managed offerings today on IBM Cloud and AWS. So uh, if if what you're looking for is a pass forward that's, that, that is the cloud and um, IBM or AWS is one of your strategic cloud providers. We'd of course recommend the SaaS solution. Now, if you're on one of those, um, if you, your desire is to go to the cloud and you're on one of those analytic appliance platforms that are going to support uh, in the next 12 months, this is why we're bringing our best practices to the table for say Azure and GCP, uh, because you'll probably want to be on a timeline to deploy something prior to us having a fully managed service. But I will make the roadmap statement that Azure is next on the list once we get this DB2 warehouse uh, on the cloud Gen 3 out, uh, and then uh, and then uh, we'll continue on after that. So DB2 warehouse is basically what the architecture looks like from a SaaS perspective uh, from uh, uh, IBM, and uh, we support the IKS environment, and of course we support uh, Red Hat OpenShift, and it includes all of the um, all of the topology and, and as it's required to give you uh, uh, regular backups. And we also have a very similar architecture for DB2 Warehouse and Cloud on AWS. The backups are just a little bit different. And AWS is what we're focusing on. I've mentioned this Gen 3 a couple of times. AWS is what we're uh, focusing on first from a Gen 3 perspective. So let's talk about that. Today, our DB2 Warehouse on Cloud, uh, the offerings <clears throat> kind of uh, uh, top out in sort of the mid triple digit terabyte range. Uh, so, you know, kind of the 300, 400 terabytes. Um, and there are a few items that are not there yet, such as 
uh, multi-tiered uh, storage and, and uh, a more granular set of options from the point of view of uh, uh, backup and the recoverability strategy, as a, for instance. And of course, to ensure that we're uh, bringing a cost-effective uh, solution to the cloud, uh, we need to have native cloud object store support as well. Now, DBT supports cloud object store for many things, but we don't have that full IUD. It's actually one of it's part of your you know native DBT table support in the cloud, and that's something that's coming uh, in the first half of next year. So, what is Gen three? Gen three is closing the gaps that do ex that uh, a functionality that does exist in our analytic appliance today like granular backups and like multi-tiered storage and so on and the ability to scale beyond the petabyte into the petabyte range warehouses and um, uh, and, and close those gaps as well as bring in the native cloud object store support at the same time. So that's really what Gen 3 is. So that means that uh, if you're a client today in the analytic appliance, there is a, a good chance that your workload uh, would be fine moving to DBT warehouse on cloud today um, however, if you have a dependency on on some of that functionality that I mentioned here, where there's still a couple of gaps, or you're kind of more in the petabyte scale um, uh, environment, then you'll want to wait for Gen 3, which will be available on AWS uh, uh, early uh, next year. All right, and so then that brings us then to the uh, reference architectures and the self-managed best practices. And we're going to get into detail on those reference architectures in just a moment. But as mentioned, there's an x86 variant of that and a power variant of that. And if you want to move to the cloud um, on, say, Azure or GCP prior to us having a fully managed service, then uh, you can leverage those uh, best practices from the reference architecture into a, um, a solution that is self managed uh, for the cloud. But the self-managed there on the bottom left is only recommended if you're looking at a cloud provider where we don't have our fully managed solution yet. All right, so that's basically the storyline from a cloud perspective. So now let's look at uh, what's going on from a um, on-premise uh, uh, reference architecture perspective. And this is where our um, on-premise solution come into play. Again, hardware is sold separately. They're available for petabyte size uh, warehouses, full functional compatibility with the analytic appliances that we have today. Um, the uh, uh, the x86 uh, uh, control nodes can tie into a cloud pack for data system environment, and so it's not part of the cloud pack for data system architecture. But if you've already uh, invested in the DB, sorry, in the Red Hat OpenShift kind of control node underlying platform that can be leveraged as part of our um, reference architecture going forward. And so this will bring significant performance improvements using latest generation hardware and uh, latest storage. And of course, this has full support for DB2 vNext. So it gives you compatibility, not expansion capability. That's, that's not something that we've ever provided in um, uh, with, with generations of the appliance, but the ability to uh, have both your existing appliance and, uh, and the reference architecture running at the same level of DB2, and you could use one for depth test or something like that. So there is compatibility there. And uh, both reference architectures, we're hoping, you know, somewhere close to the end of this year, uh, maybe early next year, is sort of the timeline that we're hoping to be on. Now, John's going to get into more details on this, but you notice down at the bottom the kind of appliance slice. There is a little bit of a barometer there in that uh, we expect that the power based reference architecture will be the most appliance like because the power team at IBM has come up with something called a cloud rack, and they're going to have a cloud rack for DB2. Um, we have partnered with Lenovo for the x86 reference architecture, and we're looking to see how close to that same experience can we get um, with Lenovo as we're, as we're going to do with IBM Power. Um, and, I, and there's still some open questions there, and bottom line, it's a different vendor, right? If you go and do the Power one with the Cloud Rack, it's, you know, you can do this all on one purchase order with one, um, uh, with one vendor, all right? It's all IBM. Uh, but reality is, on the x86 side, you're working with multiple vendors, uh, you know, no matter what. 
All right. So these um, uh, reference architectures are both leveraging Linux, both DB2U, that new universal container technology. And we are going to now turn it over to John, who's going to take us through the details of each of those reference architectures. Okay, thank you, Les. And I guess Martin, you'll uh, shift me to control, and I hope that I'll be able to share quickly. I can do that. Let me let me just do that now. All right, you are the presenter. -y. Found out my problem that I was having with playing the theme music. It turns out I had iTunes running, and uh, it wanted control of my speakers. Bless their heart. I stopped iTunes and now it plays. Now you should be able to have something there to click, John. Okay, show. Yeah. You clicked it yet? I'm getting there. Right. Yeah, we have to give permission. We got to give permissions. Yep. Yeah. We should have tested YouTube. <laughs> there. Okay. Okay, Les, just go ahead and flip through them because it's it's telling me I need to quit and reopen the go to meeting. All right, we'll make we'll, we'll go back to Les here. <clears throat> so, Les, are you there? Yeah, sorry, I'm just sharing my screen now, coming off the of mute and. Uh... We'll get to get back up and running here and uh, you you're back you're back all right let me just yeah. uh, get into full presentation mode can you guys see the presentation okay yes 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 okay. all right so okay just let me know if you want me to change pages and here right we go. there right right there okay one up one up one great uh, up one less up one page yeah, okay. This is so as let's yeah, so let's kind of set you up. Whoop, no, you were right. All right. One page. Yeah, right there. Okay, as, as Les has brought you to the here, I'm going to first talk about uh in some more detail about the reference architecture in X eighty six and then um and then, uh, then we'll go into some detail about the uh, power ten, which I'm gonna to refer to as uh, private cloud rack for DB2. So what we've done, we're going to deliver uh, the reference architecture and, and documentation in the fourth quarter, December timeframe in 20, uh, this year, 2022. Uh, so what we've done to assure, uh, you know, soundness in, in, in the documentation is we've completely built out and tested uh, as if we were going to deliver a, uh, a, a an on-premise appliance and, uh, and 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 then we'll you know provide all that documentation and then if you go with the Lenovo and I'll share what we have here if you go with the Lenovo on the x86 then all the performance numbers and and things that you see in the documentation you can uh, rely on that if you if you follow that architecture completely. Otherwise, um, the architecture will help you build out um, you know the infrastructure if you go with Dell or some other x86 uh, supplier. Okay, next page. Okay, so here's a picture of the uh, of a full rack of the x86 uh, version, and uh, and what we have uh, fully uh, designed, uh, uh, unit tested, integration tested, and performance tested. So it's based on uh, Red Hat OpenShift, 
and we have a uh, current uh, version is, is 4.10. 4 and uh, what you might know of the storage is OCS as a 4.8, the name changed to ODS, OpenShift uh, Data Factory, I think is what, the, what that stands for. Uh, but it's basically next generation of uh, OpenShift Container Storage. And we're on 4.10 there as well. So what you see here at the bottom is your control nodes, or sometimes referred to as master nodes, and that is where the OpenShift uh, uh, is. Well, OpenShift is installed across, but this is the control nodes for for the OpenShift platform. And uh, I'll, we'll go into a little bit of detail of what that uh, infrastructure looks like. So anyway, uh, it's um, it, it's there's three of those, and then you'll see. Um, six worker nodes. Uh, it, there's more here, but what we tested for a full rack is six worker nodes, and then a, a failover node is, is in the orange. Uh, from our uh, the uh, IAS appliance, where you have a bonded 40 gigabit uh, network uh, solution for the internal FCM traffic as well as the corporate traffic. We've upped that to four 25 gigabit or a, a bond 100 gigabit network environment, and in part of what you know, part of the driver of that, but we're doing it both in in both uh, power and x86. But part of the driver here on the x86 is that we've always known about the SCM traffic, uh, you know, TCP/I traffic running across the network. But here, with the storage being ODF and internal NVMe drives, uh, now the IOPS is also traveling across uh, the, that 100 gig network. So uh, where it's always been isolated to you know fiber channel HPA traffic, now we have both the IOPS and the intercommunication uh, on, on the same network. And, and then there's the one gigabit uh, ethernet for management and then your power supplies. So this is what we've put together uh, and tested uh, some customer uh, uh, workloads that are very highly representative of what we have out there, plus some of the standard uh, uh, TCP uh, DS uh, testing. And, we, and of course, we built that up from 10 uh, 30, 50, and 100 uh, terabyte uh, testing, and we'll we'll provide all that uh, performance numbers. Uh, the the basically uh, across the board, uh, we're probably average about 3x over IAS on the same footprint. In some cases, it's you know four and five x, and in some cases, it's maybe two and a half. So. We're, uh, that's where we're at. So next chart, and we'll start going into some more detail here. Next chart, Les. I got the next there chart in my go. screen. Okay, got it. It's just delayed here for me. So, okay. So the control nodes, the three at the bottom, uh, their think systems, the low think systems, you see the SR6456. Uh, uh, they got the one AMD uh, uh, processor, it's a 16 core server. Uh, it will have 256 gig of memory. And then it has the, for the storage, it has four two terabyte MME drives and then uh, two uh, 400 gigabit for hot swappable SSDs. And so what, what's running on these servers is the OpenShift platform software. Okay, next chart. Okay, now for the workers, a little bit beefier servers, we'll break this down shortly on, on what this means to uh, the number of MLNs and the, and the resources against the MLNs uh, uh, in these worker nodes. Now, here in the worker nodes, all, all the worker nodes, so DB2, uh, DB2 uh, 
uh, uh, Cooper, Kubernetes deployment and, and for the on-premise and what we tested is OpenShift. And, you know, it, so it's, those workers are only going to be running DB2 and, and DB2 is isolated into its own workers. And why I point that out is you could take the reference architecture and build it out as is. Uh, but as Les says, if you already have cloud factor data, then you would take this reference architecture and add these worker nodes onto your cloud factor data environment and, and then, then deploy your DB2 cluster and, and database on those worker nodes. Um, if you don't have cloud factor data yet and you build this out as a standalone um, DB2 warehouse environment on, uh, on OpenShift, then when CloudPack comes into play, the interaction between CloudPack, whether the DB2 services are, are inside the, um, inside the, the CloudPack for data as services or external, the interaction and, and performance of the interaction is gonna be the same. So uh, uh, it, it, it just gives us a nice option to uh, deploy independently uh, if we're not ready for the additional uh, services that you get in the base and then the base plus of the cloud factor data. And again, a little bit beefier, there are 48 core servers, uh, one terabyte of memory, uh, rounding up you got six, uh, eight terabyte NVMe drives and that's driving all of, you know, all the storage. And in this case, we tested with Replica 2 and Replica 3 as, uh, you know, as Red Hat, you know, prefers Replica 3. Uh, we, we got through all of our, well, we got better performance Replica 2. We got through all of our uh, HA testings and, and reliability just fine on the, on the Replica 2. And in this, uh, the, the reduction of, of I.O. with the one less copy of the data, our, our performance went up. And also, you, you have more uh, room, more space and capacity. And we certainly got the compute capacity to, uh, to drive more data. And this gives us the ch uh, option to do it. Additionally, there'll be uh, some... Uh, there'll be at least one HBA card uh, on each one of these servers with open ports to be able to give you the option of uh, a, a, of a tiered storage type, same, same tier storage solution. Okay, next chart. Okay, looking at it from a uh, MLN or maybe in older terms, I've been working in, with DB2 since 1984, from basically the very beginning. Moved into the DB2 LUW environment under warehousing since um, uh, 1995 when Triple E team, so our universal database. So the MLN, uh, multiple logical nodes, uh, sometimes is referred to as the you know hash partitions. Or, or sometimes partitions will be as we overuse that name. So uh, that gives you an idea of what we're focused on here. <clears throat> what we've done with this reference architecture and going forward is, if you're familiar with what we did with IAS, we basically had two deployments, uh, a, a, a column biased um, deployment and a, and a row biased deployment. And either one of those, uh, as you always are with DB2, you can always create any data, uh, table type that you wish, excluding uh, a range partition table and columnar, but you can create any table type you wish uh, in, in any DB2 deployment. And so you can have, a, and it's a good, it's a good practice to have a mix of row and column depending on your on your workloads. But what we've done here is through additional testing, we, we've understand that we can mix these worlds uh, very nicely uh, with the additional compute that we give it. So obviously the column bias solution said our dominant workload is going to be more analytical in nature, maybe uh, independent data marsh discovery exploratory areas, and the row bias deployment 
uh, was going to, uh, is more of a, a mixed workload dominant workload that you commonly seen in operational data stores and enterprise data warehouse, departmental data warehouses, and dependent data marts, and, and a mix of user communities. So the ODS type workload uh, best benefits by the horizontal parallelization, and you get that by the larger number of MLNs which in, in IAS, that was eight. In the uh, analytical workloads, it, it gets better served. Those complex queries can be broken up into multiple segments and, and have the intra-partitioning uh, uh, parallelization, or I refer to it as vertical parallelization. And you typically had a fewer number of MLNs, in, the, in our case, four, but much more compute and memory. So what we've been able to do here is mix that and we can have the MLN, eight MLNs for a horizontal parallelization, but with the 48 core servers, uh, that gives you, you know, five cores per MLN. It gives us a, you know, instead of 64 gig, 100 gig of memory per MLN. And that allows us to take advantage of the horizontal and vertical parallelization uh, that we, uh, that we, that we've uh, come to know how to best use when. So that's what we see, and then of course the, the the storage is the ODF and uh, a, a, a available as direct attached MVNEs on the uh, uh, on the servers. This notes here the three-way mirroring, as we have now uh, recommending the two-way mirroring in in the reference architecture that you'll see deployed. Okay, next chart. And okay, so now we're going to move on to the uh, the power reference architecture, which I'm referring to, and it'll be referred to as the private cloud rack. You, you may be familiar, uh, our, our IBM Systems organization uh, has has uh, deployed a cloud rack offering since power nine. Uh, they have it uh, for cloud, cloud rack applications, cloud rack for Oracle, and now uh, cloud rack for DB2. And the, the as, as less kind of alluded to, uh, now this, the reference architecture is gonna be delivered in, in the fourth quarter, but the actual private cloud rack for DB2 uh, part number, and offering uh, won't be until the February timeframe next year. Um, but even now or then, when we get to that point, um, what will happen is a properly sized unit uh, for your application and database will be sized and the, then the private cloud for DB2 will be uh, manufactured and built into an IBM uh, factory, and it will be delivered to you, wrapped up, and ready to be introduced into your data center. Um, what's yet to be determined, but I'll say what you know, it, it was real possible that once uh, it gets to your data center, um, services will be there to get it introduced into your into your data center, get it powered up. If it's a multiple rack solution, get those multiple racks cabled up as they need, and it will be delivered with uh, with uh, uh, Red Hat Linux as the platform uh, uh, software, and OpenShift already uh, deployed, uh, in, in, you know, on it. And then, then after that, then what will be the uh, installation and the creation of the DB2 cluster, and and the data and your database, and all that will be uh, built to uh, the specifications of the of uh, of the delivery questionnaire that is sent prior uh, prior between uh, purchase and delivery. So, let's move on to uh, the next chart. Okay, so this chart here, the first uh, that's um, 
I'm going to show you here that this this has the appearance of of five racks. But really, this is the five servers, and you'll see the rack configuration in a minute. So again, like the like the x86, we got our masters um, or control nodes, and we have three of those. And because it's in the cloud rack uh, setup. Um, the the red is going to be the you know the open shift deployment and then the yellow is in this case we're we're going to uh next generation uh flash modules so the storage that that the database engine will be reading and writing from will be again sand storage and so the spectrum scale servers uh, will be on these master nodes, and I don't know why the X is there, but the, the, you'll have an HMC for management. And then, so that's the yellow, one. and then the green part is all of the cloud cloud rack management software. And so that's what's in the first three nodes, and then the remaining is going to be DB2 with the Spectrum Scale client. And you got your as, as a minimum configuration, you got your uh, one worker, and then uh, the failover. Uh, the, the failover worker. So let's go to the next chart and see a it's, it's see the a full first rack kind of picture. Okay, so here's what would be a completely full rack, uh, uh, and it's the first rack. So here we got our masters, and it, and everything is going to be Power Ten servers. They're all two U uh, Power Ten servers. Uh, you, you'll see some detail, but the, the masters, again, uh, the compute is is appropriate for what the masters need and, and smaller. There are 16 core power team servers. And then in a full rack on the first rack, you have uh, you have six workers and then a failover. Okay, so a total of 10 servers. And, and you'll see that 10 is, is where we're at always, and, and what you'll see in rack two and rack three are, are even number racks and other odd number racks. So you got your uh, six workers. We'll go in some detail on these here in, in following pages. Um, your failover uh, uh, worker. And then here we've got uh, two in a full, a full rack. We've got two FS7300s. That's driving our flash, you know, flash modules. So it's a it's next generation upgrade from uh, what you saw on IAS, and you see two here against the six. So uh, if your if your size for uh, if if you only need one worker node, you'll have one FS7300. Uh, up to three, you'll have one FS7300, and then the fourth through the next group of three you'll be driving through the FS7300. So um, there's enough IOPS and, and throughput uh, in these to, to, to drive what three worker nodes would be asking for. Um, and, and then each, each worker node will get uh, approximately 33 terabytes of flash storage to uh, be managing the MLNs on each of the workers. HMC for uh, the, the cluster management. Uh, you see the one gigabit uh, uh, management network. Uh, you see again the 25 gigabit by four bond, so 100 gigabit uh, uh, network for the uh, for the FCM. Now, what we've done was we, we've placed in multiple network cards into each of the servers. So what we've done here in this in this solution, we've gone back to isolating the FCM network from the corporate network. So the FCM network will have its own dedicated network, and you'll have the, the network that connects to the corporate or the customer's network to again have three independent networks. Uh, and then then we have the SAN switches for uh, this you know the storage. Uh, and the connectivity to the worker nodes. Okay, oh, time check. So, okay, let's move to the next chart. So I'm gonna move through the next ones pretty quickly because uh, I do wanna hit uh, one chart and spend a little bit of time on one, one of the charts. So 
here's our uh, foundation compute, you know, control nodes. There's 16 core servers, uh, 512 gig of memory, uh, and then you know they have their own uh, storage for what they need uh, to to manage the op the OpenShift software, the Spectrum scales uh, clients, and the the cloud rack management. Okay, next chart. Okay, so for the worker nodes, uh, more, more compute, more power, and the same footprint as the 2U uh, Power 10 servers. Uh, there's a, a total of 32 cores um, in, in these uh, Power 10 servers. We got a total of uh, one terabyte of memory, uh, and then you know the storage uh, to to manage you know the the OS and the container and the OCP part of it. Okay. Uh, this, this chart here also kind of breaks it down uh, on, you know, the MLN view. So you'll see that we're staying consistent with the eight MLNs, you know, that 33 terabytes of four-man space for uh, your tier one storage. Um, it has the optional tier two storage that, that comes in a, in a storage rack. That's uh, 166 terabytes per I think it's actually 145 now, uh, based on what we've chosen for the tier two storage. And then you still have the open ports to add customer owned SAN storage for a tier three storage, typically used for backup space, uh, staging space, et cetera. So, uh, so we get the, uh, you know, 32 against eight. So that's four, four cores. Uh, for each MLN, 100 gigabyte of, of the memory, yeah, four power cores. So uh, that's what you look at, see at the MLN level. All right, next chart. Okay, I'll just, we'll just go on past this. This is the uh, three, shows the three to one workers to one uh, FS7300. Next chart. Okay, so this is labeled even rack, and I'm going to hit the even and odd rack on both in this this one chart in the interest of time. So um, the so the even rack, so it, it could be rack two, rack four, uh, you know, rack six. We still have the ten servers, but we don't. We only need one set of the masters. Okay, so now instead of six workers. Uh, as in work in, in rack one and even racks, we're going to have nine workers and one failover. And because of the three to one ratio, we'll have three FS7300s to, you know, drive the, the, the storage management and the IOPS and, and, and the gigabytes per second throughput uh, for these nine servers. Uh, then this, there'll be a SAM switch for the servers here in this even rack. Right, go ahead and flip to the next one. Uh, okay, so for all the odd racks, by the time that we've attached uh, the, net, uh, the rack, even rack to the network switch in rack one, we've, we've consumed all of our network ports. So in the odd racks, again, we'll have the nine and the, the three 7300s against the nine workers, or still a ratio of, of one to three. Uh, we'll have the failover, we'll have the sand switch, but we'll also have another uh, two network switches to manage the network on this. Now, these network, network switches, each, each one of them has four 100 gigabit ports. So you have eight 100 gigabit ports that will be daisy chained to the odd, the next odd rack to the left. So in this case, if it's just this is the third rack, then this would be daisy chained to uh, to rack one. And if we have a fourth rack, then uh, the fourth rack will the, the, the network these this network switch 
will be the network switches for the servers in the fourth rack, and then uh, and then if we have a fifth rack, then this, then that uh, will be daisy chained to this one, and as we go from uh, uh, right to left. So uh, let's, let's see. Let's go to the next chart. I think this is it. Yeah, that's it. So. I kind of started moving a little bit fast. Uh, we'll we'll work on what questions there might be out there, uh, but I hope I've been able to, uh, with, between the two of us, give you an idea of what is the future uh, for IAS, PDOA, and the roll your own configurations that we, we have out there that you all uh, do your warehousing work on, and, uh, you know, and the options of the cloud, uh, the reference architecture and very, uh, for x86, and then you can have a very specific option uh, with the Lenovo uh, uh, infrastructure setup, and then the power is is very related to the private private cloud rack offering from systems. Um, and so I'll leave it at that. Unless you have anything you want to add, or Martin, it's it's your show. No, I think uh, I think that was that was great, John. Uh, um, is there any questions, Martin, that we should be focusing on in the in the chat room? Or I don't see any questions. It's a smaller audience today. It could be the uh, weather or some other things going on. But uh, uh, um, if you're uh, down in the states, of course, Tuesday is voting day. Vote early, vote often, as they say. Uh, but uh, I think it's great information, and I'm sure there will be a lot of downloads on this presentation. So with that, let me uh, take back control and uh, make myself the, uh, oops, I click the right thing, make presenter, there we are. Uh, show my screen, uh, there we are. Should be seeing me, again, seeing you again. And uh, just, yep. there's so many different windows. I got things on top of them things on top of things I need to click. There we go. So with that, I will move to the next screen and I will ask our final polling question, which is, did you learn anything today? And, uh, let me watch that question. Let people vote on that. And with that, we're getting some votes in. Are the presenters allowed to say yes or no? Every time I hear John presented, I learn something new as well. <laughs> well, there's your answer. 100% of our studio audience learned something today. That's a great number that we like to see. With that, uh, uh, I can actually cue the, the uh, closing music. And uh, we finished pretty much on time. Thanks for that. People always like to finish on time. And uh, uh, once again, John, uh, great to meet you online here. Uh, Les, nice to see you again. Uh, and uh, we'll see you next time on the DVD Night Show in two weeks for a Z show. And then back in uh, in December for Kerry Romanoff on 1158. Have a great weekend, all. We'll see you soon on the DVD Night Show. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thanks very much. Thanks.